Hello everybody and welcome to Whoopercast. This is episode 18 for the 8th of September 2016. As always, I'm your host, Joe Yates. So before we get into today's episode, I do want to give a big thank you to you guys, to everybody listening, to everybody watching, because the channel has just recently hit 100 subscribers, so yay! Um, 105 actually at the time of recording this, which is pretty hype. Uh, I really am very appreciative of everyone's support, of everyone subscribing, watching, liking, um, commenting, everything that you do. I really do appreciate all of the help and support that I've gotten on the channel so far. Um, yeah, this is a great little mini milestone to hit, and I can't wait to mi- hit another 100 subscribers. So thank you very much to everyone who has helped me get to this point. But anyway, in this week's episode, um, I'm going to be talking about sort of my first impressions of the new format, of kind of how things have shaped up so far, especially because now that world is over and we're moving on past that, uh, we're looking at kind of what we're going to be playing, what we're going to be seeing at the top tables now with this new format that we're working with. And I think, given that everyone now is like is collectively ha- is their has their mind set on um, the new standard format, it's we've gotten a lot more information than we did before. Um, PTCGO rotating was really great because now it's much easier to see what people are playing. This has been a great resource for me so far going into the new format, just because it's been fantastic knowing what's popular. And the best way to know what's popular is just get online and see what everyone else is playing. And uh, so I actually really like it as a resource from that perspective so far. Um, and so far, it's been really interesting seeing what other people have been playing. Of course, we're kind of hindered because we still can't use Ninja Boy on PTCGO. I mean, seriously, I'm very lenient with the developers of this game because I know it's a small team. But really, I mean, come on. I really want to play Ninja Boy in like all of my decks. It's severely limiting what I can show off to you guys as well. Um, so hopefully that gets fixed soon. I, I don't know why it's taking as long as it is, but whatever. I'll leave them to it, I guess. Um, anyway, but the format itself, I don't think anything's really shaping up how we sort of thought it would initially. I don't think anyone's first impressions are just guesses, really, at the start of uh, before we actually rotated, before September 1st hit, has actually panned out so far. Um, and I think we're getting a much better idea of what is popular and what is successful so far. And again, this is why PTCGO has been so useful, uh, in my opinion. To know what I, what kind of deck, give me a better idea of what kind of deck I would want to bring to a big tournament. And speaking of big tournaments, we still don't know when we're getting any of them. Uh, this is, again, I'm very frustrated with Pokemon actually this week, which is unusual for me, I know. But I'm very frustrated that we have absolutely no information on when our tournaments are coming. You know, this time last year we knew where Arena Cups in Germany were coming right around the corner. We had tournaments in September. If they announce a regionals in Europe in September, I'll be like, well, you know what, I may not be able to go because booking last minute flights in September to other European countries is kind of difficult. Um... The ECC, the European Challenge Cup, is announced. That's all booked as well. I've already actually got all my plans sorted for that thing because that was a hell of a lot of fun last year. And um, yeah, even if it's in February, I still want to guarantee that I can go to it. So that's already gone. But I'd still like to know when we're actually going to be getting regionals in other parts of the world because we can assume, right, that there's probably going to be one in October. Like October, November, at least that kind of time. It feels like that will be a good time to start throwing the regionals out. It feels like you know, that's time enough to get the ball rolling on this front. Uh, so it's really weird that we haven't seen anything on there and say, this is when regionals will be, this is what the best finish limit is, this is how many regionals there will be. There's so much more information and it's making it really difficult to plan out a season. Uh, so what the hell? We really do need some info, or at least just a date when we're going to get info on. Uh, I'm very frustrated by that at the moment, and I'm sure most of you are as well, but... I guess all we can do right now is wait, and just hope that we get information as soon as possible. But anyway, for now, what I think about the format so far is that nothing is really planning out the way people thought it would, init- thought it would initially. I think for the most part, like there are a lot of the bit decks that people thought would be really good have ended up being really good, um, except for Mega Ray, obviously. I think people have found out very quickly that that thing's just not as good as it was on paper, and we're probably going to have to wait till Karen and Dragonite EX come in as support for it. Um, Dragonite, of course, in Evolutions, which when you bench it, you got to search your discard pile for any two Pokemon um, and put them into your hand. I think that's really, like, Karen will help it, but Dragonite will then sort of make us really start having to consider it again. Uh, I think that's the big turning point for it, but that's like three months, two and two and a half months maybe off, so... I think Mega Ray players are going to have to just hold out for a little bit longer. Um, but anyway, I think the most interesting thing that I've found so far, and I think that a lot of people have probably realized, is that there is no outright BDIF. I don't think there's anything that we can claim is the best deck in the format. I think every single deck that I come across and every single deck that I see other people playing, there always is one or two issues with it that hold it back from being 
an absolutely dominant force in the meta. And I think there's always going to be something, you know, it doesn't see, feel like the Nightmarch format again, where there is just this one huge influential factor that makes us feel like we have to bring a deck that beats this particular deck. I feel like you could go safe enough into a tournament at this stage of the day, taking an auto loss to a particular deck that seemed popular-ish on paper. I think it's just way less threatening than um, the Nightmarch format was, and I um, because we did have to plan around Nightmarch a lot, and it did affect all the other decks that sort of were good. This just isn't the case anymore. Um, and it's not just because Nightmarch is gone, it's just that nothing really even replaced Nightmarch. There was no like deck that's come up and been as dominant as that was. There's no deck that's come up and been as threatening and as worrying as all those other decks. And any decks that you are worried about, hopefully this particular cast will dispel those myths and will try and... Because what I want to do is go through a lot of the faults of the decks that are in the format right now and of the ones that are seeing a lot of play. So, what decks are popular? From my own pers from my own playing on PTCGO, the decks that I've played against the most, by far and away, have been Xerneas Giratina and Mega Mewtwo. And so we'll start off with Xerneas Giratina. This is, I think, something a lot of people got excited for. Uh, Xerneas Break got very expensive very quickly. To sh I mean, which either shows the lack of demand, like the sheer lack of them that actually got put into packs for some reason, or the just amount of demand it got right off the bat. I'm not quite sure which one it was, but it was one or both of those things. So, of course, the synergy here is kind of similar to the whole Dark Ritina thing, where you get a lot of energy into play, you use double dragons to increase the amount of damage you're doing with your Xerneas, um, and that's really the whole strategy of the deck, is to hit hard numbers with non-EX Pokémon. I think part of the difficulty from this deck comes, sort of, it creates its own problems. Like, it's, on the one hand, it's difficult to play, and on the other hand, it's difficult to build. It's difficult to build because you have kind of options where, do you want to use Max Elixir? Do you want to use the Tina at all? And if you do use Max Elixir, how much energy do you use? Um, do you couple that with... Because, like, the thing about using Max Elixir is that it's kind of counterproductive, because you're using Geomancy, which takes energy out of your deck, which means the max elixir is now less likely to hit. And when you're doing that, it becomes really awkward, and you're like, well, do I skip Geomancy entirely and just rely on max elixirs? Do I just rely on Geomancy? Do I try and find run an unholy amount of energy and just use a combination of both of them? And finding the right balance between those two can be tough. And on top of that, you've got to look at things like Experience Share, which can keep the energy in play after you get knocked out. Um, and then you got to think at that point, do you even need the Max Elixirs? Do you even need to Geomancy? On top of that, which Xerneas is better to run? Do you want to run some kind of weird hybrid with Rainbow Road and stuff like that? There's an awful lot you have to think about. Um, even if you want the Tinas at all, it's a kind of in question, I'd say. Yeah, it, it is a very powerful deck when it gets going. It's getting it going, though, is the issue, I think. Uh, and, and as well as even playing it, like I was saying about Geomancy, kind of taking away from your Max Elixirs about knowing what to put your energy on, about making sure you don't have any easy Lazan targets on the board, um, while still being able to get Giratinas down with energy on them. And then you want to Floatstone those, because otherwise you have to manually retreat them. Although I suppose you have Fairy Garden, so you can ignore that. Um, but yeah, it, I think you have a lot of problems when you're playing the deck yourself, and that kind of creates a lot of difficulties for you. Um, it's one of those decks I think you just have to play absolutely 100% perfect with a perfect list. Otherwise, like... A perfect player with a perfect list will perform like drastically better with this than someone who's even like 1% worse, I think. I think there's like a huge skill gap for this kind of deck. Even if on paper it makes a lot of sense, it's one you just gotta practice, practice, practice with this thing. But hey, that's what PDCGO is for. Um, I still think the kind of energy attacks based on the amount of energy you have combined with Giratina combo is still really powerful, and I like Dark Ritina as well a lot. Um, I still do like that deck. I think I'm kind of more apprehensive about playing it now because a lot of people are playing Xerneas Giratina, which has a much better time against Dark Ritina. So your kind of mirror match is like a lot worse than it otherwise would be. But that's to work out, I guess, depending on why it ends up being super popular in terms of tournament play. On top of that, against decks that just take quick KOs against you, like Volcanion would, you really don't have much of a way to come back into the game. Like, then at that point you're relying on the Max Elixirs as opposed to the Geomancy, and that all comes down to how you build the deck in the first place. But if you're, like, Xerneas, if your main attacker is just getting killed every single, like, turn, there's really not a whole lot you can do about it. Or if your opponent's able to design up a Giratina and kill that, and take maybe, like, 60 damage off of your output just by that, and two prizes in turn, now all of a sudden you're in a horrible position. 
uh, and it becomes an awful lot more difficult to actually get back into the game. So I think if the if there are a lot of decks that kind of do pride themselves on being big one hit KO decks that don't revolve on Megas, obviously because Giratina helps out with the Mega thing thanks to its Renegade Pulse ability. I think those kind of decks like Volcanion and like um, even Vespaquin can probably do it. Even the new Mega Gardevoir has a pretty easy time against this kind of stuff. Um, I think those are the real issues that you want to be looking out for. As for the other super popular deck right now, I'd say the most popular deck. I don't think anyone would argue with this. I feel like I, this is really by far and away the most thing I've seen so far is Mega Mewtwo. Um, and yeah, this makes sense. I mean, damage swap is really difficult to play around with. But I think this is a risky play in and itself. And I think my reason for this is that the whole deck relies on your opponent not having something that can hit 210 damage. If your opponent does have something that can hit a big number, you lose. That That's kind of the point of the deck, which really sucks. I mean, granted now, there's quite a lot of decks that don't hit that number. There's quite a lot of decks that will struggle to hit 210 and won't be able to KO your Mega Mewtwo. And those are the decks that you're absolutely going to just walk over, no question. But there's also decks that can. There's decks like Mega Ray, which, okay, you can counter with Parallel Cities and Garbodors if you really want to, that's fine. You can probably still, like, win out against that. There's other decks like um, like Xerneas Tina, like I was just talking about. They can build up a ton of energy super quickly. Giratina's um, ability is very difficult and annoying to play around if you're a Mega Mewtwo player, so that's a, kind of an awkward matchup. Um, Klefki, as well, can be kind of annoying, although that only prevents damage, actually, so no, it actually won't prevent the damage swap. Um, a lot of techs like Magirna EX, even uh, the regular basic Mew, uh, Mew EX, when that comes out in... I think that comes out actually like next week, so it'll be legal by like early October. All these things are super good techs that can actually deal with Mega Mewtwo pretty well. So you might think, alright, well all of them are ability reliant, so I'll just run Mega Mewtwo with Garbodor, and then you come across other problems like, well, what if they just kill the Garbodor? What if... which isn't that difficult at all, really. What if they just, um, what about Mega Gardevoir, which is a Psychic type that in turn isn't weak to Psychic, so it's able to take the KO and there's really not much Mewtwo can do to respond, like, very early on. Um, I really don't think, as much as I like Mega Mewtwo and I think there's a lot of going for it on paper, I don't think it's got enough in it to sort of counter the things that counter it. I don't think there's anything that really outright makes Mega Mewtwo, like, super unbeatable. I think it is super beatable, and there is a lot of decks that just inherently can do it. Even Volcanion can just hit those numbers super easily. Uh, again, this is all about killing the Garbodor, but that's really not that difficult. Um, and this is why I think some players like have been leaning towards Hex Maniac in Mega Mewtwo builds. It's just because, well, you can't like stop a Hex once you play it. It does take up your support over the turn, and that comes with its own issues, but it's all about thinking what you want to counter yourself. Um, those are my thoughts on Mega Mewtwo. I, I like the deck, but I can't see it being the scary top-tier threat that everyone's concerned that it will be. I think there are still definitely going to be things that uh, just beat it, and that's just the inherent nature of the kind of deck that Mega Mewtwo is. The other deck that I've seen get quite a lot of hype so far, and the other deck that people have played on um, a lot online, the one I've actually played at a decent amount myself, not online because I just don't have the cards, but um, that's just another problem with PTCGO, but whatever. Um, it's Mega Scizor. This is a deck I'm pretty fond of. Again, after playing with it, I'm seeing all of the issues that it does sort of come with, and it can be quite annoying to work around these things, uh, but I do also like it a lot. I think it's got some really cool tricks that it can abuse that no other deck can, but I'll get to its issues in a minute. I'll start off with what, what it does. It just does 120. Uh, you discard either a special energy attached to your opponent's active or a stadium in play. Either one of these is grand, but the whole discarding your stadium thing is actually really cool. This means Mega Scizor can get away with like stupid high counts of Parallel City, and in a format where everyone's running Hoopa, that's very cool, because you can basically guarantee you hit a turn one to like really put people off playing Hoopa. You can Parallel City yourself to remove all of your shamans from the board and leave yourself with just super bulky Scizors and stuff, um, and that's really awesome. Like I think my list at the moment runs three Parallel City, and it is honestly the coolest thing ever. It's so much fun to play, because you can Parallel City yourself to remove all your Shamans, and then you just discard your own Parallel City so you can keep benching Scizor if you want. Uh, you hit a turn one all the time because it's just there, especially because that deck, I, I believe, should be running Skyla anyway. Um, Skyla's a great help in that deck as well. Like, you just have so many options with it in that kind of regard, and 
I've seen a lot of people as well saying, okay, play it with Crushing Hammer, play it with Flare Grunt, and this is the only way you can play it. Um, I this is I cannot disagree with you anymore. Like, holy crap, this I, I disagree with you so, so, so much. The Crushing Hammers do not work at all. If anyone finds some Crushing Hammers in Scizor that somehow works, you know, please, I'm all ears, show it to me, but I cannot see this working at all. Uh, I've played variants with and without the hammers and the flare grunts, disruptions and stuff like that. Uh, the disruption makes you so ridiculously inconsistent. It's unbelievable. You basically just sit there like, oh look, my opening hand had some crushing hammers in it. Now I can't draw well. It, it happens all the time. Like with the regular version, without the crushing hammers, I felt like the deck had so much room and I was setting up all the time and there's no way that like, I know I can just, no matter how bad my matchup is against my opponent, I can just sit there and I can just slap on my energy, I can attack, I can parallel city, whoever, and you know, it's great, it's a good time. But against, like, but with the Hammers variant, I would only set up about 50% of the time. It, it was awful. Like, I don't know, if, if you have managed to get Scizor working with, crush, with like, four Crushing Hammer in it, again, please show me, but I absolutely cannot see this being viable at all, and I think players are going to lean more towards the version without the Crushing Hammers. Uh, so there's one... I mean, it's a kind of issue with it if people do want to play hammers. I just think inherently as well, having four crushing hammer and mega evolutions in a deck is just... It's a recipe for disaster, in my opinion. I think with megas, the more streamlined they are, the better. Um, but onto the issues with mega scissor. The first one is that your damage output is pretty low. You are kind of capped at 120 damage per turn. Like max. Um, now, before I go into this further, Cobalion, the new one from Steam Siege, is a really nice little option for the deck. Um, something I've really appreciated in my own list so far. It's come in clutch quite a few times. Just because late game, it can do potentially... It can force a 7 prize game, and it does more damage than Scizor does. And that's really what you want out of it. Um, because 120 isn't a huge number, and it does come with some issues. So let's talk about Mega Mewtwo for a second, right? You might think, okay, well, I can use my um, attack to consistently discard the stadium, to consistently discard, like, uh, Shrine of Memories, that's the name of the stadium. And that way, Mega Mewtwo can't use damage change, and that way, I'll just two-shot it. This kind of doesn't work a bit, because when you think about it, like, you're still capped at 120 damage, and the basic EX Mewtwo, like the regular one, the one has 170 HP, which means that even if you do get rid of the Shrine of Memories, your opponent can still attack with the regular Mewtwo, and you still can't take care of it in one hit, and they can still use damage change to swap all the damage off. Like, it becomes very difficult. And I mean, you can use the Iron Crusher at that point to get rid of DCEs, but I feel like it's really within the realm of possibility for the Mewtwo player just to get up a basic Mewtwo with enough, with three psychic energy on it, because they have enough time to set up because you won't be taking KOs super early. Um, no, I think it's I think it's easy enough for the Mega Mewtwo player to play around. At that point, what you want as a Scizor player is maybe tech in like one Mew to copy regular Scizor's attack to hit it for weakness, but I think at that point you're overcomplicating things a little bit. These are the kind of issues that you can create by having only a 120 damage output. Um, and I know it's not a popular deck at, like, at, at all, but <laughs> if anyone watched my Quad Hoopa deck analysis, um, you'll basically know that that deck had a good time against Scizor, or at least a very winnable time against Scizor, because Scizor can't do 130, so you would be guaranteed to survive, and there was like no pressure on you whatsoever. Um, yeah, that it gets really awkward for you at some times is when you just want to do a big number and you just can't. Um, and the other kind of issue with it is, well, another deck that we've seen play is it just auto-loses to another very viable deck, which is Volcanion. Um, and Volcanion is very viable, and I'll talk about it now in a second, but there, I don't see any way that Mega Scizor can actually beat Volcanion, outside of running, like, weakness policies, which sounds awful. Um, it, it, I mean, even with Parallel City, which applies before weakness and resistance, they're still taking the one-shot. And there's really not a whole lot you can do to stop that. I guess, like, shield energies as well, but I feel... You'd need, like, Garbodor or Shield Energies and your Parallel City in play, and then just hope that the Volcanion player doesn't hit Lysander, 
um, doesn't hit like enhanced hammer if they're running that for some reason or like scorched earth or anything that could just reset like even one of your options it's just a horrible matchup and I just don't see you winning it at all especially because they have non EX's that they can use to attack as well to take the one hit KO it's just not gonna work out for you um, so I think that's also just one huge factor that keeps Scizor out from being a top tier like or the best deck in format at least but on to Volcanion, and this is a really interesting one, I think. Um, probably one of the most interesting ones, because I think a lot of people kind of wrote this one off initially because they were like, well, Blacksmith is gone, obviously all fire decks are dead. Uh, Volcanion proving otherwise. I think the baby Volcanion is the big reason why this is still a good option and still a cool play um, for the new format, is because you can still get that fire energy back onto your Pokémon. You're attaking with a 130 HP basic non-EX, which is always good. It's like the Oblivion Wing of Eltal, basically, sort of crossed with the baby Xerneas. Um, yeah, no, it, it helps out quite a bit, quite a lot, actually. And thanks to the Steam Up ability, you can actually take knockouts with the um, with this Volcanion as well. So, you know, it, it actually is quite a powerful deck overall, but it has these inherent problems with it as well. So the first one essentially is that it needs like abilities to work, no question. It's one of the most ability reliant decks in the format, I think, hands down, outside of like Greninja. But I think I may or may not get time to talk about Greninja this week. I don't think it's a lot for me to say about Greninja right now, other than it's still good. Just don't play against Garbodor. Um, but back on the Volcanion, like Hex Maniac will destroy you. Garbodor, I think less so because. Again, you can still Lizond it up, you can still kill it, you have plenty of things that can just kill Garbodor, but um, it'll certainly create some problems for you. And Hex Maniac, well, there's literally no way of getting out of that. And I think if your deck is playing multiple Hex Maniac, which I've seen a couple of decks do, and my, myself am running two Hex Maniac in one or two of my lists, uh, to deal with stuff like this, it does actually, it is quite difficult to beat. <laughs> like, really difficult to beat. So, because you're kind of capped then at just 130 damage, and, you know, you can't attack next turn, you have to sort of reset that way. Without its abilities, Volcanion isn't that solid of a deck, except against Scizor. Um, and I think that's really the biggest issue with it, is that it's there's plenty of ways to shut off abilities, like nowadays. So if a deck emerges that is super ability-reliant and is super good, it's also super easy to tech against. So I think that's the biggest issue Volcanion kind of faces. Parallel City hurts it as well. Both sides of Parallel City actually hurt it, thanks to um, its typing means that it does get reduced. Its attack does get reduced by twenty, um, not by forty, which I think a few people thought because it's a fire and a water type. So, like, would the two applications of Parallel City apply? No, it's just the one. It only reduces the damage once. Um, but yeah, both sides of it hurt Volcanion. I think it's just a little frustrating to play a deck that can be so easily countered in that way. I think it can catch people off guard though, but like I am like I said about Mega Mewtwo, I think there are some things that it will just inherently lose. And if a good water deck ever does emerge, well, everything in that deck is also weak to water, so it'll just be destroyed by that completely. Um, and we're talking about a lot of EX decks here as well, we're not really mentioning good non-EX builds that can kind of come out and uh, take the format by storm maybe on their own. The first one, I think the biggest uh, non-EX deck that a lot of people are playing, finally people are picking up on this thing. Um, just want to say I got in there first with my video on Vespiguin. It It is a good thing. You can still play Vespiguin in this format. The biggest issue is that Karen is coming out very soon. And at that point, I don't see how Vespiguin could survive in that kind of format. Yeah, with Karen coming out, it just makes it so much more difficult for Vespiguin to survive. Of course, we might reach a point where nobody's playing Karen, and then it can come in and take one particular tournament by surprise. But at that point, you know, you're just re that's super reliant on what the meta ends up being like. Um, I think it's amazing that one card can just shut off a whole archetype that quickly. Uh, the other one is Rainbow Road, kind of countered by a lot of the same things that Ray is countered by. I like this one a little better than Ray though, because obviously the dual types mean you're not as weak to Parallel City. You're not. Um, you're only attacking with non EXs, so it becomes a little easier for you. Uh, in terms of price trading with other decks, you still have a ridiculously high damage output. Uh, again, I think this is one of those decks that is just very difficult to build in the first place. Like, you can go Skyfield and dual types, you can go Skyfield and no dual types, you can go no Skyfield and dual types. Uh, there's a couple of different ways to build, like, how you want your damage output to be in the first place. 
On top of that, you then have to consider, do you want Max Elixirs and Experience Shares, or what kind of combination of both? And if you run Max Elixir, how many basic energy do you need to run? Because I've seen some lists with lots of Max Elixir and only like six basic energy, with the thought being, I only need to hit like one or two of these Max Elixirs, so it might be worth it. Um, I'm personally not a huge fan of that. I think a lot of that is taking up just space in your deck that could be other cards instead. I think Reggie Rock and Ninja Boy is a combo that you definitely want in this deck that could A, add to your the amount of types you have on the bench, and B, just sort of spring an attacker out of nowhere. Um, I think that's going to be one that when, if it ever does well in a tournament, the list that does succeed at that particular tournament will be like, it'll set the standard for Rainbow Road. I don't think, I think a lot of people are probably building it wrong. I want to give it a much more deeper look myself. Um, I think it's just a very complicated deck, inherently. So, I remember my old build of it used to be like, with Bronzongs to Metal Links onto the Xerneas, and then I had Smeargle to switch the Metal for a Fairy Energy. Um, unfortunately, we can't do that. That was a cool as hell combo that was like ridiculously weak to Hex Maniac, but uh, unfortunately we can't do that anymore, which kind of sucks, but it can still survive thanks to these dual types. It can still survive thanks to the fact that um, it's a meta with not very many good non-EX attackers. And I think anything that can be a good non-EX attacker is going to do very, very well. And finally, yes, I will talk about frogs just a tiny bit. Look, this game, this has changed, like, literally not at all since frogs of last format. The only difference being you have to take out, like, the XY Greninja, which a lot of people cut anyway. I think this is still really strong. I don't think anyone should write this off just yet. Um... Again, it is super ability reliant, it is super easy to counter, it will struggle with Garbodor, but I, I, I don't know. I feel like this is kind of the one where you're looking at it and thinking, how many decks are actually playing Garbodor right now? Not a whole lot of them. I mean, Mega Mewtwo's playing it, but I think if the Greninja just takes its time and picks off the Garbodor in that matchup, it, sh it could still definitely win. Um, I think it's kind of, in a sense, weak to N itself. Just because you don't want to get end late game and go down to a small hand size and then you can't like, oh look, I can't giant water shuriken because my hand is two cards. Um, and of course it's his own worst enemy as we all know. Everyone watched Cody in World's Finals lose because he set up like not at all. So it, it comes with its own issues, but I don't know. I feel like inherently this deck is just very, very strong. It just needs to sort of wait until people aren't playing ability hate. And if Volcanion gets good, I think... As much as Greninja can hit Volcanion for weakness, it's countered by a lot of the same things that Volcanion is. So, anyway, those are my thoughts on the format so far. At least what I've seen of it, what I've seen other people play, uh, what I've tested myself, and I think it's just been great that now that everyone's focused on standard, we get a much more collective opinion of what's good and what's bad. Alright, that's going to do it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back 5pm Thursdays, British Standard Time. Same place as always, you can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Woobercast, soundcloud.com slash Woobercast. We're also on Stitcher and TuneIn, links, links are in the description below. Um, yeah, I also want to talk about Vileplume actually a good bit, but I'm going to have a video out next week where I talk about Vileplume a bit more because I think that's something that a lot of people are looking over right now and it's something I want to sort of get a really good list for. So um, yeah, that should be out next week, probably Monday or something like that. So hey, get for look forward to that. Um, anyway, yeah, this has been Joe from Woobercast. Thank you so much for listening. And I will see you next time.